convener of the Oxford Energy Network and today I have uh, the great pleasure of welcoming people here in the room but also many people online. I think there's still more people joining us now and um, a bit of a change around from last week. We're looking this week at a topic which I think is quite important in an energy system uh, respect in terms of moving and storing energy in time and space and uh, we're delighted to have Mike Mason come along to talk to us about that. Mike is a background engineer and entrepreneur, perhaps for people who've been around a little longer like me, remember Mike from founding, co-founding Climate Care, just around the corner from me. I don't know if you still rest on those laurels, but he was one of the first companies looking at carbon accounting and so on. And of course, Mike's been a fellow at the Oxford Martin School here, part of the uh, programme for integrating renewable energy but is currently visiting research fellow at University of Bath in the Sustainable Chemical Technology Centre. And if memory serves, Mike, you did talk at one of these seminars quite a while ago about C4 photosynthesis and miscanthus uh, grass. So, so it was peptides. Oh, and yes, and, yes, and the passive acid metabolism. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Just goes to show, you can't rely on my memory, but um, I'm hoping that Mike will both add to our knowledge but also our wisdom today because I picked up his quote from Isaac Asimov which was saying the saddest aspect of life right now probably in the 50s this was is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom so we're hoping to gain some wisdom today about the case for green ammonia Mike over to you thanks Robin um I've just read, I've just read, reread actually the Foundation Trilogy of Asimov's. If any of you are interested in somebody who was very prescient and really had some interesting things to say about society, it's worth a read. So, green ammonia. Um, it's interesting to see Bill here because Bill knows far more about ammonia than I do, really. It's very dangerous talking in front of and and you. <laughs> very dangerous with this particular audience, but never mind. Um, how do I make it go forward? Uh, either clicker or oh, so use the clicker. Hello. It's not. I apologise. Hmm. I've taken your control away, have I? You've taken my control away. <laughs> Try that. Yes. Apologies. So for those, I mean, some of you will be scientists and to you, forgive me for talking about it. Some of you will not be, um, be more interested in energy and environment generally. So just a bit of background. The ammonia molecule is a nitrogen atom. It's got three hydrogens attached to it. To make it, you get energy from electricity and you use that energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen to make green ammonia. If you want to make ammonia the classic way that we make it today, you actually take methane as your energy source and split that into carbon dioxide and hydrogen water. Um, having made it, then you can recombine the hydrogens with oxygen to release the energy in a fuel cell or in some sort of burning system. And you can burn it direct you can convert it back to hydrogen or you can use it in a fuel cell. Come in, come in, don't look. Um, so that's just a little bit of chemistry. It's all the chemistry that I think you need to know. So what does a green ammonia production system look like? Have I got a me here? Laser one here. Yeah. So here you have your energy source wind, sunshine, here, and then it goes into a number of things. A small amount goes into an air separation unit, and an air separation unit basically strips the nitrogen from the air, so that we have a nice clean nitrogen stream. Some of it goes here. We need water because we need a source of hydrogen. Um, we're going to talk about this in sunny places, deserts, so deserts tend not to have a lot of water. You've got quite a lot of interesting brackish aquifers in some of these places, but you're probably going to want to be near the coast and you're going to use seawater. So you're going to have to have some reverse osmosis here, fresh water here, the bulk of your electricity, the very great majority of your electricity goes into here, an electrolyzer, which splits it off into hydrogen and oxygen. Now we're going to talk about the hydrogen piece, which we're going to store here. 
But interestingly enough, I think that we are overlooking the value of oxygen in all of these stories. And one of the things that is worth a lot more thought, and you know, if anyone's got um, students who are doing dissertations and things, looking at the oxygen economy that sits alongside a hydrogen economy is a really interesting space that I think is underexplored. <clears throat> hydrogen, we store it temporarily. The reason we store this temporarily is that these are intermittent. And if you're using solar, and I'll talk a lot about solar in a second, um, you've got, even in the desert, six hours a day. So 18 hours a day, you need to operate without, um, without a power source. When you do the modeling and you say, well, let me put a battery in here, what you discover is it becomes hopelessly economic. It's just cheaper to build an electrolyzer four times or five times as big as you need. Um, and this is a crucial piece that we need to think about. Your hydrogen here, your ammonia here, ammonia plant into a ship. And that ship can be an existing gas tanker. Existing LPG tankers have all the conditions that are required. We're not inventing something new. This is not like hydrogen. So that's a little bit about ammonia, a green ammonia site. Bill, you'll recognize that picture because you're the first person who showed it to me. What can we do with ammonia? Well, this is a bus in Brussels in 1940, April 1943, I think that was taken. In 1942, the Germans who were occupying Belgium, and it was a reasonably light touch occupation unless you were the wrong race, um, decided that they needed all the petrol for the Russian front, and so they just took it all. And the Belgians, bless them, thought, ah, what have we got? Well, we've got an ammonia plant down the road. And they converted over the six months between November 1942 and April 43, their entire Brussels bus fleet, 100 buses, they converted to run on ammonia. So I think that's the first occasion that we have of commercial use of ammonia as a transport fuel. There's a company just down the road here, Ceres, who are building fuel cells. Now, originally, these were thought of as devices that will turn hydrogen into electricity. And then, of course, we started saying, well, what about doing methane into electricity? But actually, this is a solid oxide fuel cell, and it will run equally happily on ammonia, turning ammonia directly into electricity. So that's the second thing. This is um, an illustration of some flame analysis that's being done by Cardiff University where they have a combustion research unit run by Agustin Valera Medina. Um, and Agustin is looking at burning ammonia and ammonia hydrogen mixes in um, turbines. Of course, one of the big questions is, well, what about NOx? NOx is something we want to avoid. And managing that process is, is something that he's working on with some very considerable, I think, success. The other thing that's quite interesting and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, if you convert some of your ammonia back to hydrogen, about 30% or so, the flame speed becomes close enough to that of kerosene, aviation fuel, that you can burn it in something that looks very close to an existing aircraft engine combustor. And this actually, um, I originally thought it was an ammonia turbine. It's not, it's an H25. It's a Mitsubishi Heavy Industries um, hydrogen turbine, which has been converted to run on ammonia. Um, so you can burn it in a gas turbine. So <clears throat> that's a little bit about what it is and a very quick look at the things we can do. We'll come back to those shortly. The real thing that I want to talk about here is solving the problems of energy across time and across place. Because the big challenge of renewables is that they come when God turns the sun on and the wind on and not when Mrs. Jones turns the lights on. And managing that is a huge problem. What we have here is interesting. These are three major wind sites off the west coast of California. On the x-axis, you have this unit, the wind drought. These are hours, continuous hours, with no wind. Or actually, yeah, 
Um, that's where are we now? That's the number of occasions per year. That's the frequency you get it, and that's the number of hours. And actually, there are a few instances somewhere over here, you know, where you go days and days with no wind. So you can see that although the average wind speed looks very attractive, and that's what politicians tend to look at. Oh, look, we've got this average wind speed of six meters a second. This would be great. What they forget is these occasions out here when they lose elections because the wind isn't blowing. And the problem that you've got is that coal and gas power are fundamentally low capital cost power systems with very high comparatively operating cost systems operating costs. The bulk of the cost of a coal-fired power station over its life is coal. It's not the power station. And of course, the fuel is quite easy to store. So the beauty of a system like that is you have a low-cost power station, you have a huge coal pile, you can buy coal when you want it, it makes life easy. Renewables are exactly the opposite. When you buy your wind turbine, when you buy your solar panel, you're buying 25 years of electricity up front. You have no discretion then about the on cost of that electricity. It doesn't become cheaper or more expensive. And it's got no fuel. There is nothing there to store. And the problem with that system is that you can't then say, oh, well, we'll ramp up a bit of production now because the wind ain't blowing, because you've got to buy 25 years worth of turbines. It's very difficult to build sen sensitive to supply and demand renewables. You can't just do it by over overbuilding. Look at this. This is UK. This happened to be 2010, but it doesn't really matter because this is capacity factor for UK wind. And what you see is at its best, 60%. That means a, a wind turbine is generating on average 60% of its nameplate times 24 hours a day. But what do you do here? You've got 11 days when the capacity factor is five, seven, eight percent. That's a lot of time. That's an awful lot of terawatt hours of stored energy that you need to deal with that. That's an interesting graph. <clears throat> this is 2021, quarter one. We had a bit of a wind drought. Look at that. This is gas. So what you see is an almost perfect negative correlation between wind and gas. Right. <clears throat> it's this bit that is the really difficult bit. It's all very well. You see, you see people tweeting, oh, fantastic. We've had three days without burning coal or 30 days. I don't care what the number is, but you still have to have the coal for that bit or the gas for that bit. But then, of course, you also have these events. Um, some of us are old enough to remember 1963. Uh, I wasn't here. I was out in what at the time was Tanganyika, and we had we had rain like you have never seen. I remember seeing eight inches in eight hours of rain. In the UK, they had this. This is not a time to run out of power. But what they had was a big continental scale, high pressure, cold, foggy, windless. There was no point in saying, well, let's go and buy some from the French or the Danes, because they didn't have any either. These weather systems are continental scale. So you have a real problem. So we've talked about ammonia and how it can help possibly with um, electricity, but it's not just electricity. Steel. 8% of global emissions come from steel manufacture. That's a lot. And then you've got some really difficult areas. You've got 2.5% from aviation and growing. You've got nearly 3% from shipping and growing. And you've got uh, one, one and a quarter percent just from ammonia fertilizer alone. So ammonia is an interesting fuel because, and we'll talk about how it does it and what it costs. You can use it to fill both the gaps in the electricity system, but also some of these difficult to decarbonize sectors. I've done a lot of work on aviation and modeling how we could use ammonia as a fuel, much more energy dense than hydrogen. People think, oh, hydrogen, fantastically energy dense, but not by the time you've built all the kit around it to hold it at minus 253 Celsius. 
An interesting thing that no one really thinks about with hydrogen is how do you deliver it? Um, Heathrow currently burns about 20,000 tonnes a day, a day of kerosene. 20,000 tonnes a day. Now, we've got a bit of expansion, you know, and, uh, Airbus was saying, fantastic, we've got 19,000 aeroplanes we think we're going to build in the next few years. OK, so let's call that 20,000 tonnes a day of hydrogen in a few years' time. That requires you to get the hydrogen in and to liquefy it. Now, how you, you can't bring it in as a liquid at minus 253 in a pipe. That just ain't going to happen. You can't bring it in as a gas and liquefy it. If you want to liquefy it on site, you're going to dump somewhere between three and 500 megawatts of heat at Heathrow, plus have several hundred megawatts to do the liquefaction. And then you've got to store it. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare. Can you imagine doing that in Mumbai at the airport or in Los Angeles? This is really problematic. And people haven't given it, I think, enough thought. So what does an ammonia ecosystem look like? In a sense, ammonia and hydrogen are sister fuels. It's not one or the other. It's almost certainly going to be one and the other. And the raw energy comes here wind and sunshine, you electrolyze, and then you produce hydrogen. Now you can either then use it, or you can go through ammonia synthesis and use it. Ammonia has an interesting advantage, which is that there are some things that it will do that hydrogen won't, these. Hydrogen does, other than that, all the things that ammonia can do, or vice versa. So you can see these are sister fuels and where you are and what storage facilities you have will tend to drive the decisions you make. So I'm talking about ammonia, but why particularly ammonia? Are there not other things, better things that we could do? So let's have a look at some of them. Well, this is where we are today. For these difficult to decarbonize sectors in particular, kerosene. This is um, volumetric energy density. This is gravimetric energy density. Kerosene's up here. It's brilliant fuel. Apart from the slight problem of carbon, it's really great. If we're really optimistic with batteries, we might get there. This is a log scale, by the way, and that's a log scale. You know, don't be fooled by how close it looks to that. This is absolutely nothing. You're not going to power your aeroplane very far on that. There's liquid hydrogen. It's really great, but it's minus 253 Celsius, 20 Kelvin. That's not a, that's a real challenge. I mean, you've got to get it there. You've got to put it there. You've got to have material that will hold it. You've got to have all of the freezing capability to, it's a nightmare. So that's the US government target for practical storage for hydrogen. And you suddenly, you see that it has now no real advantage, particularly. It's not a brilliant fuel by the time you've taken into account all the things you need to do around it. Never mind for a moment, the physical ground infrastructure to liquefy it on site. So that leaves us with this one. And when you talk to, I talk, talk a lot to the aviation industry and they say, oh, but well, we're going to use biofuels and e-fuels. So let's have a little wander down that route, shall we? This graph, many of you may know, that comes from the IPCC special report on one and a half degrees, um, which we haven't totally killed yet, but isn't very alive looking. And that says that come 2040-ish, we have to be not into zero, forget net zero, this is political weasel words, we have to be negative. This is net negative. This is net 10 gigaton a year negative CO2. 10 gigatons a year, just get a sense of scale. That's twice the size of the oil industry. Not being paid for, going down into a hole in the ground. <clears throat> Put that into context, for every ton of fossil fuel we use, you produce three tons of CO2. To get that CO2 out of the atmosphere, 
at 100% efficiency, you need to treat 6,000 tons of air. You need to mechanically handle and chemically treat it. And then you've got three times as much to put back down underground as you took out in the first place. This is looking really challenging. You know, I do not for a moment think that the politicians have got their head around this when they talk about carbon capture and storage. So that just to do that, it means we need to treat 30 million tons of air a minute for the next 100 years. In that context, no one is going to take their CO2 and give it to you as an airliner and say, tell you what, you go and put it in the atmosphere and I'll go and catch it back from the atmosphere. If it's in a flue because it's come from a cement plant and you can't do anything else, you're going to take it and put it straight back underground because anything else is economic madness. So in that context, where do we get carbon from? Carbon sits in the middle of the periodic table in the top row. It is probably the most useful element you've got. Never mind the fact that we're all made of carbon. The doors are, the carpets are, bits of the ceiling are, the plastic here is. Carbon is everywhere in our lives. But we can't have any fossil carbon. All carbon that comes from underground either ends up in what I call the plastosphere, this undegradable mass of plastic which is floating around our oceans, which we don't want, or it ends up in the atmosphere. There is nowhere else for it to go. So we can't get carbon from underground. So then you say, well, where is the carbon actually going to come from? Well, probably a large amount is going to come from biomass. It's going to have to come from novel agriculture, and I could talk all day about this. <clears throat> but we also need to use forests to absorb CO2 to hit some of our 10 gigatons target. So, oops. So the problem that we've got is that agriculture actually has to shrink, not grow. We can't afford this wonderful extensification of agriculture in the interest of making it all look pretty, because actually <clears throat> we're chopping down half the rainforest to do it. So if agriculture has got to shrink, you're not going to add 450 billion litres a year of biofuels from agriculture. Here's some interesting numbers. So this is a this is a paper written by Tim Searchinger and some others in Nature 2018, I think, is it? 2018. And what he did <clears throat> is not just measure how much petrol you put in the tractor for your agricultural crops, but he looked at the opportunity cost. And his definition of opportunity cost was quite important. What he said is, in an expanding market, you're pushing the frontiers of agriculture out. So what you're doing is deforesting fundamentally. And in a shrinking market, or if you if you take existing agriculture, if you could shrink the market, you could use that land to grow things like trees. So whether it's expanding or shrinking, there is a carbon cost associated with agriculture. And so he looked on that basis at a range of different things. And let's just look here at tons of CO2, what's the units there? Kilograms of CO2 per kilograms of fresh weight, right? Now, vegetable oils, a kilogram of fresh weight is a kilogram of vegetable oil because there's very much water in it. That is what you get from palm oil. So every tonne of palm oil that they want to put into an aeroplane gives rise to 11 tonnes of CO2 before you burned it. Really? That's not going to happen either. And of course, you've also got the biodiversity loss there. So that kind of deals with these. They're just not going to happen. Biofuels we've talked about, e-fuels, well, where does the carbon come from? It's all very well saying we'll use it from somewhere, but, but you've got to say where it's coming from. And there is a negative cost. And all that leaves you with is this one, ammonia. Now, ammonia is really interesting. It's easily liquefied. Minus 33 degrees or eight, some, eight or 10 bar, something like that. Ammonia is a liquid at ambient temperatures. At minus 77, 
ammonia freezes, it goes absolutely solid. It's flexible, you can burn it, you can use it in fuel cells, and yes, it isn't as good as oil. But the question is really, could it be good enough given the state that we're in? And could it be good enough comes down in large measure to what will it cost? So these are some data from the IEA 2020. Now the IEA is not noted for the accuracy of its projections, <laughs> but its historic data is quite good. Um, and what you see is that across a whole range of technologies, electricity is kind of in this range, sort of 70 to $100 a megawatt hour. That's what they say. When you get that, whoops, that was Portugal, $13 a megawatt hour from solar. This is a real auction for real power from a real company. This isn't something made up. So that's interesting, <clears throat> but then you get this. And who, did it, how, how many of you know Henry Snape here? Oh, most of you, half of you anyway. I mean, Henry's, Henry's amazing, isn't he? Um, for those who don't know, this is a mineral we've known about for nigh on 200 years, perovskite, didn't look very interesting until Henry realized that you could make perovskites in a way that allowed you to turn photons into electrons. And this is the history of perovskite solar development. And it's gone from efficiency of sort of 2% rocketing up the fastest growing efficiency we've ever seen. <coughs> but that isn't what perovskites are really good at. What they're good at is this. You can tune a perovskite to absorb the part of the spectrum that you're interested in. Now, the reason silic silicon panels look blue is because they absorb at the red end. They absorb the low energy photons and they are limited to, well, I think they're single junction we're talking about 30 odd percent. But in reality, if you want to buy a solar panel, your efficiency is down here, 20 percent. And you could get better, you know, Jing Li, I was in China a little while ago and they were tooling up to see if they could get to 22 and a half, nearly 23%. Very excited about that. I'm expecting Oxford PV, which is the company that Henry founded, <coughs> to release um, solar panels to the market end of this year, early next year, though there's some interesting things going on that I can't really talk about, starting at 26%, with a roadmap to 35%. Now, the way he does it is, to begin with, you put a silicon panel there and then you put your perovskite layer on top. And what you do is you set up the perovskite layer so that it picks up some of this higher frequency radiation. <clears throat> Once you've done one perovskite layer, <clears throat> you can put a third one on top of that and pick up even more. And actually, the final thing is you dump the silicon completely and you have triple layer perovskites. Now, that's probably a decade away, maybe 15 years away. And the issue here isn't finding the chemicals, but finding the chemicals that are stable. Um, I think that they've done the first piece of it and they've got stability tests, you know, and they've proved that um, and they're working on the next bit. So that's interesting because once your solar cells move from 20% to 30% efficient, with very little increment in cost, Price, of course, is a commercial matter, but cost. What happens is not only has the cost per watt dropped to the solar panel, but if you've never built a solar field, a bit of information, the solar panels are not the expensive bit anymore. Once upon a time they were. Now they're only 40% or less of the total system cost. You've got all the steel work, the ground work, there's all the wire connecting them. All of this stuff is 60% of the cost. If you can get 50% more electricity without changing those, you're in a very much stronger place. And so I think that, I've done some modeling, I think that we are going to see within a decade, solar power, not at $13 a megawatt hour, that will be seen as expensive. Six to $8 a megawatt hour is my guess within a decade. That is almost free. Where will you get it? 
Well, you won't get it in England, that's for sure. Where you'll get it is in the red bits of this here. Now, with the exception of California, which tends to catch fire at the moment, most of these places are too arid for people. So the irony here is that we have surplus energy where we have fewest people. And I see a few faces at the back there. This is a really interesting continent because suddenly it becomes a powerhouse. Africa has the potential to become the world's greatest powerhouse. The Australians could do, but they, I mean, they're being a bit Australian, aren't they? <laughs> um, they, 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 sorry, I just have to say this. In Western Australia, you have iron oxide, right? Iron, Fe2O3. So they take this and they ship iron and oxygen all the way up here to China. On the East Coast, they have coal and they ship the coal all the way up to China. And in China, they add value by taking the oxygen off the iron with the coal. Here, they've got 5% of Western Australia covered with solar panels running into fuel cells would provide as much energy as the global oil industry. 5%, not of, West, of Australia, of Western Australia, right? That's a sense of scale. Why don't they use the hydrogen to take the oxygen off here? They have less to ship to China from this side, nothing to ship to China from that side. They add value on this side and they make something. Pass. Anyway, they're Australians. Are there any Australians in the audience? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we, we've, we've, seen, we've seen that we've got a problem, which is a distributional problem, and also there's a time problem. How do we move that energy around? Well, we can do it with a wire. And in, it was a couple of years ago, I think it was, there was a wonderful scheme to move 26 gigawatts of power from Northwest Australia to Singapore by wire. Go back. 15 years, and I chaired a meeting in the Italian embassy looking at a project called Desertec, and Desertec wanted to build solar panels in Libya and put it in a wire and ship it all the way to Northern Europe. Both of those fell over for similar sorts of reasons. The Desertec, the Italians desperately wanted it, the Spanish desperately wanted it, the French would let it go over the Pyrenees because it would undercut their nuclear industry. The Libyans were being Libyan and then had a revolution. I mean, you know, what do you do? You, you're, you've got a single supply, you've got a single demand, and every political actor in between has a power of veto over you. You know, talk about Russian gas pipelines, it's as bad. So, and the same thing I think was the, was the issue with the um, Australian so the Australians actually, interestingly, then went to ammonia. It then got killed for environmental reasons. There's some potteroo or something that lived there, and, and the Australians were looking for a reason to kill it, but it'll come back. Hydrogen. Well, we can move it with hydrogen. <clears throat> and Shell have bet, really, I think, on hydrogen as their um, vector of choice. But you have this real problem, which is it's expensive to liquefy. It's expensive to store. Zach, what's, what are we talking about? $600 a kilo for hydrogen stores? $500 a kilo, so something like that? Or gas storage, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ludicrously expensive to store it, right? So you might be able to keep a buffer store for a day, but you're not going to do an awful lot of it, and it's very expensive to ship. In the UK, mind you, we do have huge amounts of storage in salt caverns, which are reasonably salt impermeable. Um, UA, uh, the UK Geological Survey has just re-surveyed their resource because it, last time they did it, someone just put, put a note with a pencil and guessed. And now they've suddenly realised that they've got an order of magnitude more, I think, possibly even two orders of magnitude more storage than they thought. But not, everyone has, you know, not everyone's got a salt cavern handy. And then you have ammonia. Well, ammonia is really easy to liquefy. It's really easy to store. It's very easy to transport. You can put it in a ship, an existing ship, and move a quarter of a million tons, and within 10 days, it could be almost anywhere in the world from where you ship it. It's clearly going to be more expensive than hydrogen at the place that you're making the hydrogen. But if you can't move the hydrogen out of there, that's not a really relevant thing. 
you can make ammonia where energy is the world's cheapest. And that is a big selling point. You can make it and use it where it's cheap. So let's just look at what it might cost. These bar charts here are cost makeup at a, at a zero discount rate, just, just to show you the relative scale of things. And so this is 2040 solar ammonia, and we're looking at that much is the cost of electricity. That's the cost of conversion. 2040 wind, <coughs> that's the cost of it. And this is wind in the UK um, using estimated North Sea prices by then offshore. That's the cost of conversion. There's almost nothing in it. This is an interesting one. This looks attractive. This is 2040 grid and the grid numbers for making hydrogen that I used came from Aurora. Um, and what they did was they gave me some estimates of how many hours a year you'd get at what price. And so we took it, we ranked it from the cheapest upwards, which is all very well, unless the wind isn't blowing. <laughs> so again, you know, it's only going to be cheap to make when the wind is in surplus, when you haven't got a problem. So you do have to then store. If you look over here, what can we see? Um, we've got, so here you've got three lines. You've got solar uh, ammonia, which is that one, which is the purple line made in, in this case, I've picked, I picked more of the Kenya, but it doesn't really matter, so much sunny. Um, this is 2040 North Sea wind. And those two for hydrogen, those two are almost identical. I mean, within the margins of error of my model, those two are identical. Wind powered hydrogen and solar powered ammonia are almost indistinguishable in terms of their cost across a range of costs of capital. This is grid, but we've already said the problem with the grid is that when you need it, you haven't got it. So that's not very useful. This is, um, so this is for intermittent electricity. So this is filling in gaps. This is the cost, this dotted line is the cost of gas fired open cycle gas turbine. And I think I've used $10 a megawatt hour as my base cost there for that. And when you add 100 tons, $100 a ton of CO2, it's there. So compared to open cycle gas turbines at 35% and a 55% fuel cell efficiency, which is reasonable for solid oxides, I think we we'll, might get even to close to 70 bill. Are we, would that be unreasonable? Yeah, I think there's that completely uh... Uh, so yeah, 70% actually. 70%, yeah, seventy percent. it just blows, it blows the others out of the water. So that's a reasonably conservative estimate that says, guys, frankly, there is no distinguishing between ammonia, hydrogen, and methane as a power source in cost terms. So if we can afford methane, we can afford it. Yes, go. Sorry, what is the x-axis? So the x-axis is the cost of capital. So 0%, which reflects those, and up to 7%. The firm dispatchable electricity. So this is where you've got not an open cycle gas turbine, you've got a combined cycle gas turbine, much more expensive in capital terms. Um, and I haven't included the capital cost of the of the gas plant. And what you see now is the same lines, slightly different here. Um, I think I've got 60% fuel efficiency, 50% CCGT. What's significant here, though, is that you are now more expensive than electricity from gas, but you are cheaper or the same price as electricity if you add a carbon price of $100 a tonne of CO2. And uh, Bank of America are forecasting $125 by 2030. So that's, that's a really interesting place to be. Yeah. And again. Ships, well, actually, marine transport is one of the first places we're going to see ammonia being used because you want the volume in your ship to fill it with cargo. You don't want to fill three quarters of the ship with a hydrogen tank. Um, you're, you don't have many choices. You can't do it with wood. What else is there? So Fortescue Mining, um, Fortescue um, Forest is a very interesting guy, the chief executive of Fortescue. And he's been all over the ammonia space. Uh, he's an iron miner from Australia, interestingly enough. And he announced, was he on the 11th, 
that they were going to have the first ammonia powered ship by next year. Whoops. What does it look like in cost terms? Well, you see the same graphs here. This is um, marine, very low sulfur fuel oil. Uh, this is it with $100 a tonne added. And here we have 2040 solar, which is the purple line. We have 2040 uh, wind ammonia, which is the blue line. And we've got 2040 wind hydrogen, which is that line. And what you see, don't worry about the specific numbers because these are guesses. I mean, these are forecasts. But fundamentally, you're at no competitive disadvantage. When we have got to the energy efficiency of solar that we're projecting, you know, and so you have this you have this thing, which is, do you analyze on the back of where we are today or do you do what the famous uh, Canadian hockey player um, once said when asked why he was so successful? He said, I skate not to where the puck is, but to where the puck is going to be. Actually, we need to be doing our analyses, not on where things are today, but where things are going to be by 2040. <clears throat> and aviation, aviation is a really interesting one. I did a lot of modeling here, um, and this was run against um, numbers from uh, Malcolm Hillel, who um, is a senior, senior technology, I um, can't remember what his proper title is, close to the top of Rolls-Royce. And so he he verified all of my numbers there. But then I tested it against uh, Frank um, Kirkland. Frank is the former head of civil aviation for Rolls-Royce. He was chief designer for the Trend 500 and Trend 700s. So I think he knows a thing or two about engines. And what I did was I looked at aviation and said, well, what can we do? Well, we can forego a little speed. We can go back to propellers because they're more efficient. We can use fuel cells. We can, the problem with fuel cells is they're quite heavy. So then you say, well, how do I actually get my energy needed to, the power, not energy, needed to take off and climb? Well, the answer to that is you have a hybrid and you have a gas turbine as well as an auxiliary power unit. And that's something that I know Bill's been working on of late. And so you have a hybrid propeller turbine aeroplane that provides all the energy you need at all the phases of flight you need. Very interesting. Yes, you've lost a bit of speed, but frankly, if they just closed the, the shops at Heathrow, you could save that the full weight of the journey. Um, <laughs> you, and you can get about 5,000 kilometers without changing the aerodynamics and without changing the payload on a Boeing 737. That's not bad. That covers an awful lot of the world's flying. And the opportunity exists to improve the aerodynamic efficiency by 20% or more. What's it cost? Because cost can be really important. Well, there's kerosene today. And this is dollars per megawatt hour of delivered energy, right? This isn't of the kerosene, but of what you get in the aeroplane by the time you've done all the other things to it, like burnt it and thrown away some of the energy because you've got high velocity gas coming out the back and all the rest of it. It's that. 2020 solar ammonia is that. Oh, that's interesting. Not far off, even today. 2030 solar ammonia, 2040 solar ammonia. By 2030, 2040, you have a substantial cost advantage with the most expensive part of running your airline by converting to ammonia. That's really, really interesting. Yes, you've given up some speed. Do we mind? Not sure. I'm not sure another 50 minutes on the flight to Malaga really matters. And then steel. Steel's really interesting. Hybrid is a Swedish company. This is their first plant. They have gone back to something that they were doing some time ago. I think in the 30s, weren't they, Bill? Maybe you know, making steel using hydrogen as a reducing agent. And so they've gone back to it. And I was at a talk the other day. We were both there and um, the talk was being given by the chairman of the Energy Transition Commission, Lord Adair Turner. And he had a little block of steel with him, which was from a hybrid plant, hybrid, Brit, not Brit, plant, you know, 
zero CO2. It's real. Volvo have now just committed to buying their steel from hybrid. You can use hydrogen, you can turn ammonia back into hydrogen. Um, I don't know that anyone is doing it, but I can see no chemical reason why you shouldn't use ammonia directly as the reducing agent and avoid that step completely. It's wide open to be looked at. The costs, well, we've seen the costs are about the same as hydrogen. They're pretty much the same. I mean, it's a chemical thing, not an electrical thing, but when you do the sums, it works out about the same. And yes, it adds eight to 12% to the cost over using metallurgical coal. It needs a carbon price of about $120, $140 a tonne of coal, of CO2, to make it pay. But hang on, look at the cost of steel. That's $400 a tonne. That's $1,300 a tonne. It goes all over the place. The world doesn't come to an end because the price of steel has gone up 8%. So I think that, yes, we, we might have to accept that as a cost, but it's not the end of the world. It has the advantage over hydrogen that it's very, very predictable. You can just bring it in by the ship when you want to. So now we get to the really difficult question. We know that chemistry works. We know the economics works. We know the resilience works. We know we can move it around. Is it safe? And this is the bit that ammonia will fall over on if it's going to fall over. It won't fall over on the others. And it's the bit that I always get challenged on. And it's easy to give trite answers, like we've been using ammonia for 100 years, and so, you know, stop worrying about it. But that won't satisfy people, particularly if they are incumbents, like a certain aircraft engine company that I can't mention, <laughs> who like burning things hot and um, wants to do lots and lots of biofuels without having thought about it. Um, and they will say, oh, but you know, it's an academic fantasy. It's just too dangerous. Well, I spent six months actually looking at aviation safety, and I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but I'm right. going to talk, yes? There's only one person this is, isn't And he's left. No, he leaves next week. The first thing is fire, right? In aviation, actually, the, the, there are two kinds of, three kinds of crashes. I will talk about aviation just for a moment because I like it. Um, one kind of crash is a crash in the air where no one survives. It doesn't really matter what the fuel was. It doesn't make any difference. Two airplanes hit each other and they fall out of the sky. You know, it's not going to help. We can forget those. Another kind of crash is crashes where there are survivors. They are survivable crashes. And there's a surprising number. Aeroplanes overshoot runways. People land with not enough fuel. P pilots do stupid things. Um, under pressure often. Bad weather and all sorts of things. In those crashes, most deaths are caused by fire. We need to just be careful of the risks of ammonia versus the risks of kerosene. Kerosene is really quite dangerous. Ammonia is very difficult to set fire to. This is not me. This is um, the US Department of Transportation. Ammonia is designated as non-flammable for shipping purposes because it's very difficult to put it into a condition in which it will burn. It's really very difficult. So I think we can ignore that one for the moment because this is the real issue. Ammonia vapor is highly toxic. Here are some data, you know, once you get up to here, <coughs> fatal after 30 minutes exposure, you really don't want to be there. Yeah, and you certainly don't want to be up here. Down here, it's not too bad. Certainly, you know, it's a survivable place. But the trouble with all the ammonia material safety data sheets is they look at the wrong thing. Bit of a bold claim, I think. There are a whole lot of dispersion tests. A very interesting paper here um, in Eros in 2005. So it's a safety or French safety organization. And they did lots of ammonia dispersion tests. So they took ammonia and they put it out into the atmosphere. But guess what? All of those tests were done at ambient temperature, at high pressure, with a hose pipe squirting it into the atmosphere. 
Yes, it causes a lot of poisonous fumes because you've taken a high pressure ammonia at 10 bar and squirted it out. Nonetheless, what you see, this is a log scale again, so be careful. Um, what you see is that by the time you're three to 400 meters away, your concentrations are down there. We just go back, your concentrations are down here, right? So you do have a three to 500 meter radius that you need to be careful of, really careful of, otherwise you die. But, as I said, all of their tests are done up here. This is some data from the US EPA. And they looked at the rate of evaporation of ammonia, which is, of course, what we're interested in. The rate of evaporation of ammonia as a function of its starting temperature. And what you see is that it's it's not very it's not infinite even here. And the reason it's not infinite is that the the um, latent heat of vaporization of ammonia <coughs> is very high. So as it evaporates, it, you have evaporative cooling. It chills itself, right? It's quite difficult to get it to evaporate even here. But all their tests were done at eight to ten bar up here. There is no known data that I can find here. I put this to um, people I was talking to, the health and safety executive. Some of them, I hope, might be listening, um, listening in here. And I asked the question, well, what have you got down there? What, you know, there's, there's, there's a potential program looking at testing here over, over I, I think, in the US. Are they going to test out here? And the answer seems to be, no, nobody's actually thought about it. But hang on a second, minus 80 is not very cold. It's your typical laboratory freezer. You know, your ordinary household freezer is minus 18. To get it to minus 150, you just need to bubble a little bit of liquid nitrogen through. This is not a difficult thing. It's a damn sight easier than hydrogen. So down here, you could be solid. It's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to make a toxic plume out of a lump of ice. But we just don't have the data. I modelled, when I say I modelled, that's an exaggeration. I did some very, very simple back of a fag packet sums on this data. I kind of extrapolated this curve here down to minus 77, which is the point at which it freezes. I didn't go to frozen because, you know, that would just be a step too far, I think, for extrapolation. And I said, imagine an aircraft crash. Uh, it's 200 meters long, 50 meters wide, and you spilled your fuel evenly across it, which is the maximum evaporative area you can get. And just put a 15 mile per hour wind in. Your evaporation rate would be less than two kilograms a second. It would take you nearly 10 minutes to evaporate a ton of it. And the the highest concentration you could get is about 1,200 milligrams per cubic meter, which is theft. That's the highest you could get because there isn't very much energy in air. So I think that if we're going to deal with ammonia and deal with the most extreme safety case possible, we really have to look at ammonia down here. And if anyone's got a research grant in mind, if anyone wants to do something in that space, it would be fantastic because it really, really, really does need to. It is a lacuna in our data. We just don't have data as far as I can find. How would we get rid of those risks of a plume? Well, I've got three different approaches that I've used. And this is again for aviation, but in aviation, safety is a religion. So solve it for aviation, you've solved it for everything. The first, is you do what the military do with kerosene in their fuel tanks, they fill them with a phone, open cell phone. Two minutes, um, last slide but one. Um, in an open cell phone, you can have a crash, it's difficult to break it, you cover the tank in, um, in um, fiberglass, and quite simply, it's difficult to make a mist out of that. Pump it in as an ice slush. Right, so 80% ice, 20% liquid will pump perfectly well. You can freeze it in situ if you want. It's very, and then you scavenge it with liquid ammonia. It's very difficult to uh, turn that into something toxic. Well, here's one that's really interesting, came from a colleague of mine in Bath. We could, if you all use hand sanitizer stuff, which is alcohol, but it's thick, it's a bit gloopy, it's a bit like honey. You just do a really 
do some rheology modification and turn it into a serum. We've looked at that. These things are difficult to deal with. Yeah, the rarer the event, the more expensive it is to deal with. So a couple of things, you have huge diversity gains. Countries have lots of unpredictable needs, but multiple countries don't have the same need at the same time. Locally stored hydrogen means that every country has got to have its own store, whereas central distribution of ammonia means that you can share the facilities. So ammonia fills the gaps in renewables energy systems that other things can't fill. It gives you the ability to use really cheap energy and move it around in time and place. It can compete with fossil fuels on its own terms. It competes with hydrogen and is often a lot more convenient. And it can meet the needs of some really difficult to decarbonize spaces. You can make it almost anywhere. Look at the picture up there. This democratizes energy. It makes you independent of the Russian gas pipeline or the Saudis' decision on what they're going to do with the price of oil. And it can be safe. We need some work. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what we'll try and do is take some questions from the room and from online. Uh, Mike's obviously packed a lot into his talk, which has cut down the time for questions a little. Sorry about that. But that's all right. There was quite a lot to say. I'm glad you got to the safety part. Uh, can I just ask a question to start off, which is we talked about production of ammonia where energy is cheapest. So what is the opportunity in the UK? Is it solely dependent on wind or you do think ammonia production will be largely concentrated on places where it's sunny? Basically? I don't think you're going to produce it in the UK because you might as well produce hydrogen because we have a massive hydrogen storage capability. You might as well import it. And um, the, the corollary of that is, is there an opportunity for development research technology associated with the new ammonia economy where the UK has some potential leadership? Uh, there is. I mean, we, we start with start with solar PV, start with some of our really brilliant catalyst, catalytical catalyst, catalyst chemists. You know, those things we are really good at. What we have to stop, however, is thinking <clears throat> that because we're not going to make much of it in the UK, it isn't a UK issue because global warming is very much a UK issue. We have some leading, some of the leading technological bricks in the process, and we have to see this as something that we can do, which makes life better for us, even if we fund it out in Namibia. Thank you. Can I take a question from the room? Uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I'm curious how you compare it with other uh, uh, sources such as, you know, like algae. Now that uh, you know, Chevron is uh, uh, has been working on it. And, and frankly, you know, the, the ammonia being uh, I mean, one of the biggest uh, uh, electricity utilizer users, uh, I mean, I can certainly say in India, it is a fertilizer industry. So it's kind of interesting to say that, you know, you produce you know, ammonia based fertilizer and then you take some of that ammonia and again use it for the for the electricity. Because I, I don't know if that, that uh, circle can actually, you know, is, is uh, conceivable for the fertilizer industry at least. And uh, lastly, the capacity utilization factor that you talked about, you know, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, nuclear power plants, you know, have, I mean, the, for safety reasons, maintenance, they do, you know, they try to keep it under, you know, 60%, 65%. To what extent do you feel this can have, like, you know, 95% uh, capacity utilization from a safety perspective, given that ammonia is also a, a you know, it's used uh, in explosive material. Uh, okay, know. so let's, let's dispense with a few things. Ammonia is not explosive. Ammonium nitrate is explosive. Right. I'm a mining engineer. I used to use hundreds of tons of it a day. Ammonium nitrate requires a lot of work to make it. So ammonia is not explosive, right? Um, and an ammonia plant is, I mean, they run, they, we, we produce 200 million tons a year. I can't remember, vast amount of ammonia every year already. And we run these plants full time, 24 by seven. This is not new. So this is, this, there, is not, there is nothing particularly there. It's not a safety issue. 
Uh, in terms of fertilizer, the really interesting thing about fertilizer is that we already make ammonia fertilizer. So we have the infrastructure for handling it, for moving it. We have pipelines across the United States to shift it around. We have tanks, we have safety procedures. We have all sorts of things ready to go. We're not inventing a new industry, particularly. We're inventing a new way of using an old industry. So I think that is a real strength. And finally, on fertilizer, the one thing that is really interesting is that if you get a coal spell for a week and the UK wants lots of ammonia, the world doesn't come to an end if you turn the fertilizer plant over into producing fuel ammonia for a week. You know, you, you've got flexibility in the fertilizer market and fertilizer, the world's fertilizer market produces about three terawatt hours a day of energy equivalents out of 500. So it's already it's already one and a half percent of the world's power. Thank you very much. We'll just go online. So, Tom Smith, if you're available to turn your camera on, and we'll try and bring you on the screen here as well by the miracle of modern technology. Hello. Can you see me and hear me? Just a second. Ah, try and get on the screen. Right, so we can see you, Tom. Please put your question. Thanks very much for a very inspiring and uh, interesting talk. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about the rival candidates to ammonia, um, such as uh, aluminium, zinc, uh, and other potential renewable energy vectors. Uh, um, and uh, in a similar vein, uh, you, you mentioned uh, supergrids and the Desertec project and the political instability um, implied by, by those. Um, but isn't that also the case for, for gas and oil pipelines and potential ammonia pipelines? Um, OK, so in terms of the solids, I looked for a while at um, a range of metals. The problem with them all is you have to have a return path. So it's all very well taking aluminium as your fuel, and you can generate heat with it, that's great. Um, it's quite difficult to use to do that. It's very difficult to control. But then you've got aluminium oxide, you've got to bring it all the way back again. So your transport becomes a real, you know, you have to deliver it and then you have to collect it. You can't pump it. There are all sorts of issues with it. I'm not saying they won't happen. I'm saying that my analysis today suggests that we've got to invent something that we haven't got before they become before they become close to competitively economic. Um, and the second part was, oh yes, and the wires. Look, the Chinese are building megavolt supergrids. <laughs> and undoubtedly, they will have a role to play. I have, you know, I, this is not a case of one or the other. It's a case of one and the other. But the point about a wire is that it connects point A to point B. The great thing about a ship is a ship can go from A to, well, let's change our minds halfway across the ocean. That's what happens already with gas tankers and oil tankers. You know, the trader will ring up and say, say to the captain, actually, you're not going to Tokyo, you're going to Shanghai, because that's where the price is. Um, so you do have flexibility with shipping. You don't have that flexibility with pipelines. But most of the pipelines we have today are intra-US pipelines. Um, and yes, you'll have, you'll, you know, I say none of these systems is totally immune from all of the problems. But I think this gives you a lot of immunity from many of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to take another question in the room. And just as I'm turning the camera around, we have to bear in mind with plate tectonics, Australia is getting very close to China. A few million years, it will be a lot closer. Anyway, but, <laughs> a few years, it might have changed their politics. Well, which will happen first was my question. Anyway, from the room, so you get your chance to respond to the, the jibes against Australia. Um, <laughs> so, um, just a, a clarificatory question, and apologies if I've missed this, but how, um, you said that we've got, um, the, you know, some of the technology needed, we've got plants, we've got, um, you know, the fertilizer ready to go. By how much would we need to upscale that, for example, to um, complement wind and solar? By how much would we need to upscale it to take over fossil fuels in terms of 
infrastructure and investment needed? So let's have a think. At the moment, global energy needs are about 500 terawatt hours a day. And ammonia production is about three terawatt hours a day. Right, so that's 0.6% of um, the world's energy could be produced from today's ammonia. Let's assume, let's say we're looking at 10% um, of the world's energy coming from ammonia, because remember, it's a fill in fuel. It's, you know, it's going to fill in for all these other things. You're talking about 30 times, 40 times where we are today. That's the kind of order I would think that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, Liam, we did miss you. And I think this brings me to a question if you want to turn your camera on. Um, Mike showed us a lot of energy costs, but I'm wondering if that accounts for transmission distribution levies, uh, carbon levies and so on, or whether this Possible. implies a, a captive or merchant. So uh, maybe, Liam, you're going to ask a, a similar question. Yeah, I was just asking in the bar charts that showed the projected um, conversion cost, the conversion cost differed for solar and wind and grid. Um, and I just wanted to understand why it has a different conversion cost if my understanding is the input is just electricity in all of those three cases. It's a very, very, it's a, a neat observation. And the difference is the number of hours a year I can use my electrolyzer. So if I've got solar, and I've got six hours a year, and if I've got wind and I've got two, sorry, six hours a day, and if I've got wind and I've got 14 hours a day or 20 hours a day, we've got very different needs for electrolyzer. We've got very different needs for hydrogen store. We've got very different needs for a battery to pi or harbor Bosch unit. So that's where the fundamental difference is. It's the, it's the electrolyzer. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you have another question in the room? <clears throat> Just a quick question. Um, methanol, where about methanol? Where's the carbon come from? <clears throat> okay, same so, so, you know, all of the carbon vectors are really attractive until you have to answer the question where does the carbon come from? If you've got the carbon, then yeah, sure, use it. It's nice. It's quite crazy. Can I just ask a question about? What I've heard described as a thermodynamic crime. We've invested a lot of energy, or effort, I should say, into producing electricity. And mm -hmm. I recognize that it doesn't have the ability to be transported in mm -hmm. time and space, but there's a lot of thermodynamic losses associated with producing something that gives us storage. So is the argument that it's worth going the extra mile in the thermodynamic downward slope in order to come up with ammonia because of its convenience and how would that compare with say finding an alternative storage method for hydrogen if you could in a solid state form um it's the wrong question the efficiency the thermodynamic efficiency of producing ammonia in a desert is greater than the thermodynamic efficiency of not producing ammonia in the desert because you're using something that otherwise you can't use. So, you know, it's a mistake to say, as somebody once said to me quite recently, oh, well, the round trip efficiency <laughs> is poor. I really don't care what the round trip efficiency is. I'll just build some more solar panels. The question is, what's the cost of building the solar panels? It is of no consequence whatsoever. You're using such a tiny proportion of the available energy anyway. So if this really picks off, um, are we going to see China's Belt and Road Initiative looking at access to solar ammonia generation as a, a way of capturing more of its resources externally, or can it do it all domestically? China's interesting. You, you know, you have access to Mongolia, and in Mongolia you have massive wind and solar resources. So I can see, I can see, as solar costs fall and onshore wind is really cheap, this becoming something that the Chinese are mo will move on. I mean, you know, you have to, whatever China's political position at the COP, the reality is that they have the world's biggest solar industry, they have the world's biggest wind industry, they have the world's biggest electric car industry, they have the world's biggest battery industry, they have the world's biggest nuclear industry. There are no slouches. And I think they will be, if they're not on this already, they will be very, very quickly. They're on it already. We have another question in the room. Sorry. Thank you. Um, you talk about Africa, uh, you talk about Australia, and what could be the role of Latin America 
in this ammonia industry? So, for example, because Chile, Chile where, are from, where are you from? In where are you from in Latin America? Chile. Chile. There you are. You see, you have the world's best soda resource. There is no question. You know, Chile is is. I didn't include it because Chile, Chile is already a well-endowed country with so many things. But the point about this is not so much that, you know, is it going to be Chile or Namibia, but that you democratize it. There are vastly more places where you can make ammonia than there are places you can get oil out of the ground. And but for that, example, uh, from Chile, for example, Peru or Argentina, there is a longer distance in transport. Irrelevant. So how is it Irrelevant. It makes that much difference to the total cost. Really, you know, these. I, I've done the analysis of um, shipping costs, and it's it's in the rounding errors. Can I go with one more? Is there another question? Okay. <laughs> Can I yeah, yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> Maybe we'll let Mike have a drink of water. This. Yeah, I would water. Mind. Shall we have a comment first? Um, you yeah. talked about Australia, and it's between the tropics, essentially, and uh, that's where the sunniest parts of the world are, except the Amazon uh, and the mm -hmm. Congo and parts mm -hmm. of Indonesia. Uh, but uh, um, we, we, I was in a call the other day where there were over 250 uh, Brazilians, uh, and, and you realize that Brazil, for example, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a third of it is the Amazon, but there's huge resources, and they're, they're putting iron ore, oh, you know, they're using iron ore and yeah. it away. They have a huge resource, Chile has a huge resource. Bolivia, these places really, you know, we, we the Catinga, the northeast of Brazil, is just a vast area yeah, of sunny. Australia, but the real powerhouse, it can be Latin America, that belt that between the tropics, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry about Australia, we've had it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just check if there's anyone else needs a question before your last comment. Sorry. Just a brief question about um, the aviation. Yes. Briefly about um, it being an extra 50 minutes on the flight. Is that the main sort of barrier that aviation is that they can take? The aviation industry is interesting. What they desperately want to do is the same as they did yesterday. <laughs> and they'll, they're tinkering around the edges, um, parche to anyone from the aviation industry who's online. They're playing around the edges. They're saying, oh, look, we'll do something with batteries. You know, Rolls Royce have got this Axel aeroplane up with them. Um, Yasa Motors, which I was involved with, and great, it's got 20 minutes of flight time. It's really, really, really not going to do anything at all very useful. Um, hydrogen might do a little bit, but as I said, you know, how do you deal with the logistics on the ground of hydrogen? And nobody has yet answered that for me. There may be an answer, I might have just missed it, but I haven't heard it. I think aviation is fighting tooth and nail to do as little as it possibly can, you know, with the appearance of doing a lot. We have another online question, and I'm going to try and avoid pronouncing the word oligopoly. Oligopoly. I, yes, exactly. Uh, so, Richard, I don't know if you'd like to turn your camera on to pose your question. Hi, Mike. Hello. Uh, if <laughs> things you. are as promising for ammonia as you say, uh, how do we ensure that there's not a new sort of global multi-sector oligopoly? Um, I think the thing that works in your favour is that there are so many places you can make it that you'll find, you know, unlike oil, where it requires incredibly specialised abilities and there are limited places and you can buy, a, buy into an oil patch and you've then got a commanding position. It's very difficult to buy into a solar patch because the guy next door can do exactly the same. So I think you know, all oligopolies arrive because what happens is that the guy who's got, who's the biggest, goes fastest down the cost curve and then is able to acquire more and more and more assets. But at the same time, I think it's a very much more difficult place to do that than in the oil and gas industry. I think it's it, the opportunity to democratise energy is huge in this space. Thank you. Okay, one more question in this room. Mike, how much longer are you happy to come? I have all the yeah, I thought you would say that. Okay. Um, so this, I mean, the whole research project is fantastic, but it seems like one of the last pieces of the puzzle is the modeling about the toxicity at yes. storage level. 
Um, so I want to know um, if you can answer, I don't know if it's confidential or not, but where has this research gone and where is it going? Have you, um, do you, are there any leads on a possible project to model it? Or? So uh, the answer is it isn't. Hmm. Um, I think I'm the first person that I know who has been asking the questions about the safety of ammonia as a solid or as a really cold liquid. The data hasn't been, well, Phil has looked, I've looked. Bill, have you got any data? You know, no, no, no. No. You know, and he, he's, he's the man who wrote the Royal Society report on ammonia. We just don't have data down there. And, you know, the problem we've got is, is, is your issue, Robin, which is people in the research councils in the UK say, well, yeah, but we're not going to make ammonia, so it's not of interest to us. It's very difficult to get funding for things which are fundamentally of issue, of interest to the Middle East, to North Africa, to Namibia, you know, to Chile. I, I'm very happy to run a research program in Chile, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is it's not going anywhere. And we desperately, desperately, we need to be able to answer the safety question so that we can preempt the, oh, but it's unsafe in order to unlock all of the other things that will go on in this space. If there's one piece we need to do, it's the safety bit. Maybe you just leave people slightly nervous about how safe it is and that will deter them from flying in the planes that are fueled by ammonia and then thereby reduce the demand for energy at the same time. No, but you shouldn't. Look, a, a fly, there's this complete thing about flying. Flying is the most energy efficient way we have of moving people around the planet. The problem with flying is the fuel, not the flying. Once you fuel your planes with ammonia, it becomes the world's most sustainable form of transport. Quietest, safest, least land take, least energy. Do we let you finish on an advert? I think so. <laughs> uh, so can we all say thank you very much indeed for Mike's excellent talk this afternoon. <laughs> just come around to hear an advert. Advert for next week, and um, you're going to be hearing about something back in the local area. It's pathways to net zero, uh, sorry, to a zero carbon Oxfordshire. And Sam Hampton from the Environmental Change Institute will be talking about that. He looks at uh, governance and climate change. Uh, please sign up for that because we need to be able to get links out and make sure we don't run out of space in this room. Also sign up for the newsletter to get information about future uh, seminars and other news. And apologies in advance, I'm not going to be able to make it next week. And kindly, Phil Grinnell has, has agreed to step in as host. So I'm looking forward to watching the recording of that, just as you'll be able to do and relive the highlights from this afternoon. So I hope you all have a great evening and thanks for joining us online. Thank you. Thank you.